Henry Crown Fellow, and so is Seth Goldman. And so <laughs> Seth, it's great to have you here. Now, of course, you may not know that about Seth. You know all sorts of things about him. He is the co-founder and the president and the TEO, the most unique, uh, <laughs> the most unique uh, title that anybody certainly has in this room, I bet, of Honest Tea. So Seth, welcome. I'm so glad to have you here Thank today you. and to have Thank this conversation you. with you, which is what it will be. So just so you all know, our plan is it's about 12.15. Seth and I will have a conversation up here till about 20 of, quarter of, depending on how that's going. And then we'd like to open this up, of course, for any questions you might have. <laughs> and then afterwards, Seth is going to be available to sign books uh, outside. I hope you all have gotten yourself multiple copies. Um, it's really a fun book uh, if you haven't gotten it yet. And what's so fun about it is... You know, the best books are, of course, where there are lots of pictures, and this one has lots and lots of pictures. Uh, and so uh, it made it an especially easy read for someone as challenged as me. Uh, but Seth, um, why write a book? So um, first of all, how wonderful it is to be here, and thank you, and, and to be uh, Henry Crown Fellow actually played a very important role in my, my life and my career. And so it's wonderful to celebrate this moment with everybody. And um, we thought we had a story to tell. We and you asked me to take a sip of the 25 <laughs> seconds. Thank you. Uh, you know, um, we, see, uh, we see a lot going wrong with uh, our economy and our whole society, the direction it's headed. And we wanted to help um, make people think about how business could take our society in a different direction. And we felt that honesty has started um, to do some of the things that need to be done. And we want to inspire others to do it. And I was reading uh, a lot of the business books, especially the green business books, and I was getting bored, frankly. I just was <laughs> not, uh, they weren't connecting. And at the time that I was thinking, we really need to write a book, my oldest son was in his senior year of high school. Uh, he had officially entered senior slump. That's what, that, that window after getting into college and before graduating. We know it well, we know it well. Yeah. <laughs> and um, he was reading comic books instead of doing homework. <laughs> and I, um, I, my job was to get him back on track uh, but the opposite happened. He, I would go upstairs, talk to him, and then he'd get me engrossed in comic books, and my wife would come up and we'd both be reading comic books. And I realized <laughs> that, <laughs> that the comic book was engaging me in a way that the regular business books weren't. And could we take a business story and, and make it uh, come alive? And, and our story, whether it's the tea gardens or the label design or the bottling plants, there's a lot of visual elements. And uh, came together. Yeah, I think, I think it made it for a really fun read, and I loved it that way. So let me talk a bit about your, uh, sort of set the stage here. You grew up in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. right? Which explains lots of things, including why you're a Red Sox fan, <laughs> right? And in this book, you talk about your learnings. We'll come back to those from the Red Sox, <laughs> which are good. So let's see, 1987, you graduated from Harvard, yep. right? You couldn't get into Georgetown, so you <laughs> went to Harvard. And uh, you went off to Beijing yes. to teach English, yeah. right? And then you came back, I think that's right, and you worked on the Dukakis-Benson campaign. That's right. Right, that's and you and Julie, where is your wife Julie? I know she's here, though. there's <laughs> Julie, right over here. So you and Julie met uh, during that campaign. Yeah, in that Longview, right? Texas. Yeah, and so there's sort of, there are two frames here in the book where it says you met, and then the next thing you're, you've you gone off to <laughs> Moscow together. So yeah, no, some of that How'd that work? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was one of those typical, uh, a lot of entrepreneurs have very eclectic resumes where there's no direct path, it, it, and that Amen. was me. And so um, we had met in, in uh, Texas and, and uh, really connected, and uh, my I was, I had taught in China. I was um, teaching in Russia, and you know, asked her if she'd be willing to drop everything <laughs> and come live in Moscow. I'm going to interview you next on that one. <laughs> how we got to that one? So you talk Julie into going to Russia with you. You come back. You run a pilot program for AmeriCorps. What was that? Well, about? so first I worked on on Capitol Hill for Lloyd Benson uh -huh. for two and a half okay. years, um, and uh, and and felt like I wanted to get a little closer to the action of change. <laughs> And so uh, it was before AmeriCorps was created, there was a demonstration program uh, the summer after Clinton got elected called the Summer of Service. And I uh, ran the program in Baltimore, uh -huh, um, which was hometown, yeah. Yeah, wonderful, um, really inspiring, really engaging. But I also saw that national service at the time had a lot of very passionate people who didn't necessarily have the skills to scale it. And I thought, I want to be part of this movement, but I want to get the skills. Gotcha. And that's why I went to Yale School of Management. And that's when he went to the Yale School of Management, where a couple things happened. You were 
uh, a co-founder of Net Impact, right. Right, a student organization very focused with economic development. Well, issues. focused on getting uh, business school students involved in on paths toward with socially responsible business. To have a social impact before the term was fully being right. used, exactly right. right. Uh, but also, you met your professor there, yeah. and that was a, a very important meeting. Tell me about Barry. So Barry Nelbuff is still a professor at the Yale School of Management. Uh, he is a professor of competitive strategy. And um, he had the reputation of being someone who was pretty um, a cold collar, can be a little, you know, brought, bring, brought a few kids to students to tears in class. Um, but I was a son of professors. Both my parents were professors. And so I always engaged in academic discourse without backing down. And I think that's one of the ways Bear and I clicked. Uh, as, as though we're very different personalities, he would say something and I would argue with him. And, and, uh, and he appreciated he that. Enjoyed it, yeah. And um, we found we uh, agreed on, although we were very different people, agreed on a lot of things, uh, certainly around innovation and um, thinking differently. But in particular, the fact that uh, during a case study of the beverage industry, we talked about how all the beverages are so sweet and, or watery, and there was nothing in the middle. Yeah, and you talked about that. Some of the numbers were kind of shocking. So if I had uh, Snapple up here, tell me a bit about all the drinks. All the drinks at the time really had 100, bottled teas at least, had 100 calories per serving or zero calories per serving. And it was, there really was nothing in the middle. And, and you, you, tra you, you translated it into teaspoons. Yeah, right? trigger cubes or yeah. teaspoons. Yeah, so basically, you know, 10, you know, 100 calories uh, per serving is a, at least 10 teaspoons in a bottle. Uh, which you think about when everyone, some, if you were to serve iced tea at home, you don't ever see someone put in 10 teaspoons of sugar. And yet that's what was the, you know, the, the market offering. Terrific. So I interrupted. You were talking more about him. Right? Uh, well, at the, time, at the time Barry had said, when I was a student, first of all, I was my second year of business school, so I, I got to find a job. I got to, you know, I, we just had our second son. I wasn't in a place where I could be doing focus groups and, you know. But he had said, let's make some seltzer and juice. Let's sort of find a way to make a, a lighter drink um, and as we realize in retrospect that we're glad we didn't pursue that course because that would have basically been doing market research for a big company that could have copied it. Ah, okay. So you graduated from School of Management, but yeah. you didn't go directly into Create Honest Tea. You actually no. went out into the business world, right? And you worked for, for Calvert Investments. Yeah, Calvert, just up the road in Bethesda, and was doing uh, the marketing and the sales for socially responsible investments. And it was great work. It's a great company and, and uh, certainly something I believe in. Um, so I wasn't uh, you know, looking to move away, but I, w I did. I was developing an entrepreneurial itch, and I was thinking about all kinds of ideas of businesses or or nonprofits that I could launch. What were what were some of the other businesses you had? Well, in uh, in business school, I, my classmate and I had won a business plan competition for a diagnostic. Um, it's a little. Com I, I won't go into it because it's uh, it's lunchtime. But anyway, it was. A <laughs> it's coming back to me. That's on page sixteen. Yeah. If you want to follow that one. Um, <laughs> so we didn't go into that. The other one, I, the idea I have that I think is still an opportunity, is that. Um, I went to private schools, private high schools, and, and I was always amazed how much money they would raise. And I think if you think about the wealth out there, there's more wealth if you look at the population of public high schools, their alumni, right. and yet they never seem to raise effective amounts of money from it. So how could you, how could, and I don't know if this is a nonprofit or for-profit, I don't really think in those terms, but how could you help public schools tap the wealth um, to enhance their assets, which obviously real, they really need. Yeah, especially these days when we find ourselves buying teacher supplies. Right, you know, right. I think that's right. So um, you go and work for Calvert, and this is where the book actually begins, right? So you're out for a run, and you're with a buddy, and, and uh, uh, you can't seem to find anything in the uh, cooler. <laughs> I, go to the, the I go to a beverage shop in New York City, and as we all know, there's, you know, there's hundreds of options, but I say, there's nothing here. And he said, what do you mean there's nothing here? There's hundreds of options. I said, well, there's nothing I'm, that's going to quench my thirst. And that kind of, at the time, it sent, felt like maybe this isn't a very important idea, but it at the time, it was clearly a need, and I knew it was something I could get excited about. I'm always, um, I ran track in, in, high, in college, and so I was always thirsty, and uh, <laughs> felt like this was something I could really get excited about. And just to be clear on my timeline, you guys were married how long at this point? Uh, that was 1997, so we've been married seven years. Okay. Did you get that right? <laughs> okay. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Uh, I got that. So uh, um, you had a steady job, right? Yeah. And, and suddenly this idea goes off and you say, hey, maybe I can start an entrepreneurial venture. Yeah. Uh, and you call up Barry again. Yeah, right? yeah. And Barry, so a few things. Barry had just come back from India. He'd done a case study of the beverage, of the tea industry, in fact. So he had a few great insights. One was that the tea that's used to make bottled tea in the United States is uh, the dregs. It's the, it's the lowest sort of, after they've done all the tea auctions, it's kind of, the leftover. And he said, you could spend eight times, you know, so they spend maybe a half a penny a bottle. You could spend eight times that and still only be spending four times a bottle but have dramatically higher quality tea. 
The other insight, he had come up with the name Honest Tea. And for me, that was like the bells and the, you know, the clouds clearing and like huh. this was it. <laughs> Except uh, you got a letter from Nest Tea saying. So what happened was we registered the name uh, Honest Tea, two words, and, and then also one word, H-O-N-E-S-T-E-A. We got a letter from Nest Tea saying, you're trying to mar market a product called Ho Nest Tea. Um, <laughs> so, well, we, we're not, we're, we haven't thought of that, but uh, if we would draw that name, will you let us use Honest Me? And they, and they did. Um, and then the insight I had was that, um, aside you know, the fact that tea is all natural, that it has healthy properties, is that tea is, is grown in the poorest parts of the world, right. but enjoyed by the wealthiest. It's, it's the world's second most popular beverage. It's enjoyed everywhere. Um, so you have an oppor automatic opportunity to, to create wealth at a community level without uh, artificial, you know, enhancements or subsidies. Great. So you contact Barry again. He's had these experiences, and you guys say, okay, we're going to pull the trigger. We're going to start a new business. Yeah. How's that go down at home? Where yeah. You, you've got a you know, uh, at home, insurance Julie. plan, right? <laughs> Obamacare wasn't around yet, and I had to bring right. it in today. But, yeah. but uh, right. how'd you think about so, that? So actually, at home, Julie was supportive. I you know, still appreciate that fact. At work, it was a little odd to go into Bar to President of Calvert, Barbara Kremzik, and, and, and to Wayne Silby, the founder of Calvert, and say, I'm leaving a great job in a great company um, to launch a beverage company. <laughs> and I remember the, the long pause uh, <laughs> on both sides, because um, I had no experience in the beverage industry, no, um, no experience with production, distribution, uh, any of that. Um, but it was, um, I felt like I, you know, if it didn't work, I, uh, in fact, I had a conversation with Barry because just before I gave my resignation at Calvert, I, I called Barry for one last boost of confidence. I'm going to go in there, resign. Um, are you sure we're going to be able to make the tea? Because we never made it anywhere but our kitchen. And Barry said, I I'm pretty sure we can. But, uh, <laughs> but, but if you want to go ask for a sabbatical, I bet you they let you do that. I said, no, I don't want to hear that. that you want to be all in. Yeah, all in. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Good. So you put a lot of time right up front into thinking about the brand and what you wanted the brand to stand for. Yeah. Honest tea. Talk more about that. Well, what's interesting, if you go, we have our original business plan on our website. And, and that plan, and what it describes actually is very much of the brand, what came to pass. What didn't, what had, what, what, what's totally missing from the plan is any discussion of production and distribution. Once again, I didn't have any knowledge. So it, turns, it turns out those are pretty important uh, in the beverage industry. <laughs> but the idea was to create a product that is what it says it is, that that um, is closer to nature, uh, closer to uh, authentic ingredients, and closer in authenticity to the communities, authentic relationships. Right. And, and so it really was about doing things differently. And, and one of the themes in the book certainly is there's always that pressure to, to, to be like everyone else, um, to make the drinks sweeter, because that sells more, to make the drinks cheaper, because that sells better, too. And, um, I, and we obviously resisted that pressure in the world. And you guys, uh, this was you weren't hiding behind a brand because your name was on every bottle. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. they all said Seth and Barry. <laughs> in the beginning, we sold enough that I could have signed every bottle. It was. Uh <laughs> 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 and so um, I know that this this brand, Honest Tea, has been tested over the years in the sense of you were put in situations where you had to make yeah. choices about how transparent you were going to be. Yeah. You, um, about that. There was always that the challenge of calling yourself Honest Tea is you you put yourself on a pedestal and and you have to. Um, to, you know, to live up to it. So um, we had situations in 2003, we had broken glass in some bottles. And um, we had the choice, uh, the supplier had delivered faulty glass. We, uh, two different Whole Foods found two different pieces of glass in a bottle. Um, so um, we recognized there was a problem, and we pulled all the product from the market. And it wasn't required, but we just didn't want to take that risk. And what was interesting, there was another company who was about the same stage as us that didn't do that, and, and then eventually did go out of business. An interesting um, footnote in the book that you yeah, read there. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, we'll talk later about the sale to Coca-Cola, but even there, as we went through that process, wasn't there, I think there was a remark, well, if you think Coca-Cola is going to somehow interfere with the brand, maybe we have a, yeah. an LLC by this out. Yeah, but, mask the, right, the right. Um, and that we could have done that. But to me, the whole reason we decided to partner with Coca-Cola because we believed in scaling the mission. And we recognized that there were going to be some perceived, you know, uh, dis dissonance there, but we had to have the conversation. And if we if we had covered up the investment, we wouldn't be having that conversation. And it's still, you know, we still have that conversation. I mean, it's still uh, it's an ongoing conversation, but it's one I absolutely, you know, believe in having. Great. So we'll come back to the Coke sale later, but. Uh 
So you decide you're going to launch this company. You pull the trigger, you leave uh, Calvert, uh, and you start formulating this tea. And w you have an R&D lab for this? <laughs> it's our kitchen. Uh, no, so. <laughs> no, it, I mean, that's the wonderful thing about tea. It is, you know, um, it's the world's, as I said, the second most popular beverage. And every culture in, around the, the world has tea. Native Americans brewed herbal tea. And in South America, there's mate, and, and obviously black tea and green tea. So um, it was just a matter of finding ones that we could make accessible, that tasted good cold, that tasted good with less sweetener, and putting them in a bottle. And, and our, today, still, our recipes are as, you know, this is green tea and sugar, uh, and, and, and not too much sugar, but, and citric acid. So that's a pretty basic recipe. I, I couldn't you know, protect it even if I wanted to. Yeah, a few years ago, my wife and I went on a, a bike ride up the Crescent Trail, and we wound up in Bethesda, and we're sitting there eating a bagel by this on a bench, and I said, you know, I think Seth's company is somewhere around here, and suddenly Seth ends up riding up on a bicycle <laughs> and invites my wife, my daughter, and I up into the uh, office there. When you go in the office, their R&D lab, it, it's a kitchen, basically, <laughs> and there's a bunch of cubicles and then a, a kitchen in the corner with a refrigerator. Yeah, and sort yeah. Of the, when Coke came to do their visit, their first visit, they, you know, because we had won all these awards from whether it was consumer uh, reports or men's health or gourmet food, and they, you know, so all, where was our R&D lab? And, and <laughs> we took them through the kitchen and they said, well, where's the R&D lab? I said, you were just in it. <laughs> <laughs> you missed it. You blinked. So you, you come up with a formulation and then, of course, you're trying to figure out, can we actually sell this? Yeah. And it's a great story, but in the end, your first order comes from whom? Whole Foods. Whole Foods. The, and they ask you for, what, 15,000 bottles? <laughs> yes, that was one of those awkward moments where, <laughs> you know, you'd be careful what you wish for. We never made it anywhere but our kitchen. Um, but uh, the buyer said, yeah, we'll take 15,000 bottles. And I, this, was, this was basically March 1st of 98. And I said, well, give me, give me three months, and I'll have it uh, delivered. And we got it to him by Memorial Day. Yeah, but talk about how you got it to him. It was not easy. We, we went to, um, so the idea was, we called it honest tea because it was real tea leaves versus most bottled tea being made with powder or syrup, not real tea leaves. And so um, we would go to different bottling plants and they'd say, well, and we, I went to a soda plant you know, up in Glen Burnie, Maryland, and they'd say, well, we can put liquid in a bottle, but we can't put you know, a hot liquid in a bottle. So then we went to uh, a beer plant. They could ferment, but they couldn't do you know, hot liquid. We went to a, a, a jelly plant, a jelly packing plant. They, they could put the jelly in, but they couldn't filter the tea. Finally, we got to an apple juice plant up in, ba in, in uh, Buffalo that was having <laughs> a slow summer. <laughs> they said, well, we can heat it up. We can put, um, we could, we could figure out how to filter the tea, um, but we were asking them to do so many things differently. We wanted to bring in spring water. We wanted to put the front and back label on. Uh, they said to us finally, they said, well, and we want to use organic cane sugar instead of or high fructose corn syrup. They said to us, now, are you sure you're not going to want to pack 25 bottles in a case? <laughs> I said, well, why would we do that? He said, because we don't do that either. <laughs> <laughs> And you literally had, you had to brew tea. I mean, you had yeah. to develop a... <laughs> well, it was so funny, because in, in, at one point in the book, Barry's like, well, look, we take, you know, he's, he's sitting there with a tea bag and a teacup. He says, look, you just multiply this times 10,000. How, time, you know, how complicated can that be? <laughs> <laughs> it was complicated. Um, it, and it's, now we've got it right. But, it, but those first production runs, we would have, you know, sort of an inch and a half of sediment on the bottom. And people would say, well, am I supposed to chew that? Or... <laughs> <laughs> And, and these early days were tough, right? And so I, I remember, it was, what is it, a month into launching the business that your son had a health yeah, issue? Yeah, no, so literally the day Barry and I are making tea to bring to Whole Foods to make our first presentation, uh, Julie walked in with our middle son who had just come back from the doctor and had been diagnosed with a coarctation of the aorta. His aorta was closed off and was going to need major surgery. Uh, and that was one of those early challenges of just about compartmentalizing that I had to do and actually really had to do for a good part of the business. Yeah, And you, you had to, so the plant's up in Buffalo, yeah. right? And so you had to Eight be driving drives. back and forth. Yeah. And meanwhile, you're trying to find out where besides Whole Foods can we distribute. Yeah. There was even a, you rolled the car at one point. Didn't yeah, you? yeah, that, that was a low point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we were, it was uh, Buffalo, you normally has a lot of snow. That year they hadn't had any snow and it all seemed to cap fall on one day. And literally they got 30 inches within a 24 hour period, or not 30, but it was whatever it was. It was dramatic. I can't remember the exact number, but that was the wrong time to try to drive back to um, Bethesda. And uh, yeah, rolled, rolled a car off the highway and uh, it was a low point. Amazing. <laughs> so of course, for any, any business starting up, the challenge is how do you get shelf space, especially it's especially something like beverages. And this is a big part of this book here, talking about how do you get that done. Talk a bit about the challenges. You know, we were, as a challenger, we were, there were, there was certain space that was already taken by the big brands. And so we were 
li fighting, and I, you know, I use it's it's almost literal um, to get space in, sh in sh um, the the, the, in, uh, the open space, which was always less, um, because the world doesn't need another beverage brand. There's a lot of beverage brands out there, so we had to have something meaningfully different, and it had to sell. Um, and so for us, we were very fortunate that it did, and the best allies really from the very start became our consumers who once they tasted it, and it wasn't for everybody, especially in the beginning, it was a very different taste. But for the people who it was the right taste for, it was the only taste. And so they became our advocates. And, and I had people accusing me, you sent your mother into the store. To <laughs> 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 my mother was up in Boston. That wasn't my mother, but it was somebody who was saying, where's the honest tea? How come you don't have it here? And you learned a lot about how the distributors really control that space. Yeah, That's critical. Really, really you really can't, you, you, um, you just can't get to the shelf. You can't ship at UPS because it stays in the back uh, and it's expensive and it's glass and it'll, it'll break. And um, even for us, we went to the beverage distributors. We went to the Snapple, the Anti-Connectors distributors, and they just said, it's not, it's not gonna sell. Hmm. And so we had to go other ways to market. We worked with bagel distributors, corned beef distributors, anybody in a truck, cheese distributors. It was just whoever could go to the shelf. And eventually we started taking up enough shelf space that the beverage distributors paid attention. And you didn't have much of an advertising budget, Zero. right? No. You got, a, you got a few celebrity endorsements. Uh, you? Un unintentionally, but we would, you know, uh, um, what happened, Barry went to a yoga retreat and it just so <laughs> happened that, uh, that Oprah was there. And, uh, and so he had samples and, and they were cold. And so, so lesson and number one, <laughs> always have a bottle yeah. to hand out. I was going to say, well, how did you know Oprah was there? Of course he didn't know he had the, the product. Um, President Obama became an early honest tea drinker. At the time, he was Senator Obama, and, and uh, we would have to try to figure out how to get him product along the campaign trail. <laughs> uh, so it w those were funny moments. Um, but it was obviously the, the broader group of people who really took on the brand and started talking about it. Great. So you decided at a certain point, for those of us who followed you, that, that uh, you could branch out. Right? And so yeah. you could extend the brand. And so you went into Honest Aid and, and uh, Honest Kids, well, right? But you had some false starts as yeah. well. Yeah, well, in the beginning, we thought we were a tea company. We thought the most important part of our name was Honest Tea. So the tea. And so we had tea bags. We had fresh brew tea. We invested in a bottling plant. And um, those were not successful ventures. And it was only when we took a step back. Actually, it was funny. This old people appreciate the local angle. So we were actually approached by the chicken out chain. Uh, to make them a lemonade line. And we made it, we thought it tasted good, they ended up not taking it. And we said, well, we could make this ourselves and call it Honest Aid. And then we realized, actually, there's more than just lemonade. We could take a lot of the same drink. In fact, um, what happened was my, my middle son was um, going, to, I was making the lunches, the school lunches, and he would say, Daddy, you sell really healthy drinks to grown-ups, but you put really sugary drinks in my lunchbox. And I, he was right that the drink pouches I was putting in had 100 calories per pouch which is more than per ounce than a can of soda. And I said, you're right. And we came out with this line, Honest Kids, with 40 calories per pouch. And that's now over 35% of our business. It's growing uh, really quickly. So it helped us appreciate we're much, the, our brand is much bigger than just tea. Great. And you tried, at one point, you got distracted, though, right? You were going to do tea bags. We did have tea bags. Those didn't work. Uh, the bottling plant was a disaster. We lost a million dollars there, and I was, um, so. Yeah, we've certainly had our, our share I, of I think one of the best things about this book, by the way, is it's sort of lessons learned along the oh, way. Oh, yeah. And so uh, you'll go through a whole section of, uh, of drawings about a particular um, uh, episodes, but then they'll sort of stop and say, let us talk here about what we learned in this business. It's really, really well done. So um, in 1998, I think you sold 40% of the company. Two, 2008. Two thousand. Excuse me. 2008, yeah. you sold 40% of the company to Coca-Cola. As you said, it feels like dissonance there. How, yeah. What was your decision making? Process? So we had grown the brand enough. We were seeing, now we're starting to see national opportunities. Uh, we were approached by large national chains, Safeway as an example, and they'd say, we want the product in all our stores. I said, well, we can fulfill your, you know, we can get it to the Mid-Atlantic, we can get it to California. We can't get it to Chicago, to Dominic's. We can't get it to Texas. Um, they said, well, that's, that's the opportunity. That's what we need you to do. And so we were losing those opportunities. And for us, we go back to the impact we really envisioned. How do we change the diet? How do we help change uh, what's going on in agriculture? And it wasn't gonna, if we only stayed in, uh, you know, in the niche, we weren't going to make that happen. So we needed a partner who could help us scale. And we were approached by um, most of the major food and beverage companies uh, about an investment. And so for us, when Coca-Cola approached it, it made a lot of sense. They had a, a new entity c called Venturing and Emerging Brands designed to invest in brands, not to just take them over. And uh, we were still looking to, to, to scale, and that was a great partner, largest, world's largest beverage distribution system. Mm. So it worked out well? 
So far, yeah. So Coke uh, in 2011 exercised the option to buy the rest of the company, and um, I'm still running it. And and just to give you a sense of scale, when we when Coke invested in 2008, we were in 15,000 stores. Today, we're in over 100,000 stores. Uh, when Coke invested, we were buying about 800,000 pounds of organic ingredients. Uh, this year, we'll buy over 5 million pounds of organic ingredients. So we're really starting to drive change, both in the diet, uh, in the American diet, and at the, the community level in uh, these communities we source from. Yeah, talk, talk to me a bit about those communities you source yeah. from. They're from all over the world. They it's are. an interesting supply yeah. chain. Yeah, so we, uh, obviously the core ingredient being tea. Uh, we source a lot of the green tea from China, a lot of the black tea from India. Um, but then we also buy red tea from South Africa, hibiscus from Egypt, pomegranate juice from Turkey. Um, so, uh, and we, we also buy, we now buy more than half the world's supply of organic OU kosher white grape juice, which we buy from <laughs> Turkey and Argentina. We had to send the rabbis over to um, Turkey and then over to Argentina to, to buy that. Um, but the impact on these communities is, is large. Yeah, right? so there's a few things. Number one, organics and fair trade both involve a premium. That's prior to market. And tea is a commodity, so often it's sold at, you know, sort of a minimal price. Organic embeds a higher price in it, and obviously means a higher price to the consumer as well. Um, and same with organic uh, on the juice side as well. These are, the, it helps uh, justify a premium price, not to mention, you know, from the mission perspective, you know, a healthier impact on the ecosystems, a healthier impact on the people picking or involved in the supply chain, and we believe in the consumer as well. Mm. And you didn't go fair trade right away. You right. said that uh, maybe it's not the right Well, we, we, we always had that aspiration to, to think about connecting with our communities, but it was just not feasible. In the beginning, in 2003, we brought out the first fair trade bottled tea, and, and we had a conversation. What would it take to make everything fair trade? And we realized it was going to make it more expensive. We would have had to condense our margins. And I remember at the time, the woman involved in our marketing said, well, we need to do the right thing. I think she was implying that we needed to make it all fair trade. And I said, but how can that be the right thing if it means either we go out of business or we have no margin to grow? And so um, it took eight years. It wasn't actually until after Coke bought the company we were able to make everything fair trade hmm. certified. Which I think is another great thing about this book. It's one thing to talk about starting a social business, but you can't be social if you're out of business. <laughs> and so you made some very tough decisions yeah. along the way, which I think were, were great. So you had a lot of great mentors who helped you through this period. Talk about a few of your mentors. Yeah, well, uh, aside from Barry, um, we were very fortunate to attract a really amazing group of advisors. One was Gary Hirschberg, the CEO of Yo! of uh, yogurt, of uh, uh, Stonyfield Farm Yogurt. Um, Jeff Swartz, the, the chairman and CEO of Timberland, the footwear and apparel company. Um, and those were folks I didn't know before we launched, but they were just attracted to the business, which is wonderful. Uh, they reached out, they became board members, advisors. We had a great uh, Pepsi bottler who became an advisor, who, uh, as he pointed out to me, we couldn't be more different in our politics. Um, but he loved the business and was wonderfully supportive. And was incredibly helpful in helping you penetrate different distribution channels. Yeah, yeah, just strategy too, how to think about how to work with large companies as Great. well. So the uh, Boston Red Sox is a source <laughs> of great learning. What did you learn from the Boston Red Sox? I, I grew up in, um, I was at, at, when I, I think your peak baseball following period, at least for a kid, is around 10 years old. And I grew, I was born 1965, so 1975 was my peak uh, Red Sox fan experience. And that was the year the Red Sox made it to the World Series, you know, had a heartbreaking loss. And for a period of years after that, they continually got really close and would just collapse. And so um, I learned to live with disappointment. I learned to live with, <laughs> I, I learned to regenerate hope every April. And um, that was very much the case with building Honest Tea. Those first few years were painful and we got rejected by, we were just like, every day was rejection. Rejection from investors, rejection from distributors, stores, uh, prospective employees. And it was just bouncing back. And uh, saying, well, this is, you know, you've got to create new hope. And, and I, you know, the, 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 the easily my single biggest task is to create optimism within our organization. Excellent. And in fact, at the end of this book, you lay out a sort of uh, key learnings, right? And one of them is, is uh, uh, take care of your family, personal, and spiritual health. If you aren't laughing or smiling on a regular basis, recalibrate. Yeah, yeah. And we certainly went through some periods where I wasn't always, uh, I thought there was always smiling, but I was probably grinning on the inside. I, I tell the um, story in there about really in the first month, just after we delivered product, we were at a family picnic. I was having a slice of pizza, and um, I felt something crunchy in my mouth. I said, well, there shouldn't be anything crunchy in a pizza. <laughs> it was my tooth had cracked. And so I went to the dentist, and she says, well, you know, I can tell you, you're grinding your teeth at night. Are you under any distress? <laughs> <laughs> I say, yeah, I guess you could say that. Sure, we well, have two options. You could, you could 
try deep breathing, turn the lights low, and you know, before you go to sleep. Or you, I can fit you for a night guard. <laughs> I said, give me the night guard. I've <laughs> <laughs> been using it ever since. Excellent. <laughs> so as a Henry Crown Fellow, and just as an individual, you would be naturally um, inclined to this. But we try and find entrepreneurial business leaders like yourself. Yeah. And part of the purpose of this fellowship program is to nudge them a bit to think about their impact on their mm -hmm. local community. Mm -hmm. And so you have been involved right here in Bethesda yeah. with Bethesda Green. Tell yeah. us about that. So we were supporting sustainability in India through fair trade partnerships and, and, and uh, in China too. But we weren't, I mean, aside from working here and living here, we weren't investing in our own community in the same way. And so in 2007, uh, our first step towards that, we had done a national bike promotion. We were buying uh, 500 bikes. And so I went out, uh, I said, well, first of all, we're going to buy bikes for every Honesty employee. And then I went to all the large employers in Bethesda. I said, we're going to be buying all these bikes. If you want to buy in with us, we're not going to buy them for you, but we'll let you buy in at our price, which you know, is a good deal. And we'll throw in a case of Honesty for every bike you buy. And we got a few employers who did it, uh, Calvert and Federal Realty, the large, and then Chevy Chase Bank. I said, well, that's kind of fun. Um, and then I said, well, what more could we do? I've always been bothered by the fact that Montgomery County has great on-street res uh, residential recycling, but no recycling bins throughout the downtown. So when Coke was investing, I said, you know what? I'd like to send a signal to the community that we're staying here. And so Coke wrote a check for $35,000, which we then turned into buying recycling bins for downtown Bethesda. Thanks. And we got um, different partners to match the donation. And then we got, and then my we were negotiating with our landlord, and I said, well, um, you know, you guys have all these restaurants co collecting your grease. Where does it go? They didn't know, but it turned out it was going to go to dog food. So why don't you try converting it to biodiesel? And so that was a fun next step. And then we got, um, then I went to Chevy Chase Bank, and I said, we'd love to have you guys invest in this. How, you know, is there any way you could provide office space for our um, one, one executive director? And I, I didn't know at the time, but they were not, um, they were in the process of being bought, becoming Capital One. So they couldn't give us a check, but they did have office space, and we've, we're still using that space. And it's a, it's a green business incubator. Uh, we have 16 green entrepreneurs launching uh, green businesses out of there in Bethesda. Excellent. So. Great. And you have a big gala this week, don't yes, you? Yes, that's right. For Bethesda Thursday night. Green, yeah. exactly. Good. So uh, last question for you, then, then we want to open up for the group. Who's the leader you would, business leader you admire the most? I have to say Gary Hirschberg. I think he really has set the path for um, maintaining integrity and fighting and standing up. I, I first met Gary, this was when I was at Calvert, so 93. He was still small business. And he, he spoke to the head of Monsanto and he said, I've got a business where I'm you know, probably dealing with 100 cows and I'm trying to make my change. But you've got a <laughs> business where you're impacting millions, not just cows, but consumers. If you were able to make change happen at your level, think of the change you could have. have and, and what happened in turn is Gary eventually got to the scale where he could make change happen. And so both in terms of scale and, and passion, and, and he's also been a great mentor. He and his wife have been great mentors for Julie and me just in terms of living through some of the challenges. Excellent. Great. Good. Thank you so much. So yeah. let's open it up for questions. <laughs> questions for Seth? Yes, please. I think we have a mic coming your way. And if you could yes. identify yourself. Oh, thank Thanks. You. Well, I was reading through the wonderful bio that you have and presented, and I saw your father was the professor that I actually had Oh, in that's college. so nice. <laughs> so, so I'm delighted to meet the son. <laughs> and I do have a question about your parents and yes. what they think about your entrepreneurial yes. spirit since they're academics. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so my father, Marshall Goldman, is a professor of Russian economics, and my mother, Merle Goldman, is a specialist in Chinese history. And um, they... <laughs> They were um, incredibly supportive. They were, um, my, I've always thought of my father as an entrepreneur, even though he's an academic, which is not necessarily, they don't necessarily go together, but he was always starting up programs at the Russian Research Center at Harvard and at Wellesley College. And um, his check was the first one in. And they were always, their, the collective checks were the first one in. Um, and they always, um, would um, offer to do more. You know, I, I, I would talk to my dad about how things were going, and, says, and he'd always sort of say, um, well, look, if you ever need any more investment money, and I would think in the back of my mind, I'm not going to be payroll this week. And I'd say, well, <laughs> actually. Um, and so um, they've, they've continued to be great, wonderfully supportive. And I was just with them last week up in Boston for a book event there. And so it's, it's really nice to feel that they're, they're benefited. And a nice footnote is that um, just in the past few years, we have set up partially through the sale of Honest Tea, both uh, there's a Marshall Goldman Chair of Economics at Wellesley College and a Merle Goldman 
chair of history at Sarah Lawrence, where she went. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Hi. Here we got a mic coming. Yep. I, 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 I too don't. know uh, the Goldmans very well, <laughs> uh, and um, wanted to know what about your children? Are you are you getting them in the business? I mean, are yeah. you? One of the one of the real treats of this business is that it is something they can understand and interact with. So um, going back to the earliest days, they've been to the tea gardens with us, and those have been some of the most. Uh, really wonderful family moments we've experienced. To, to the tea gardens are magical places. I mean, we've never been to Disney World, but we've been to these tea gardens <laughs> where you see a, a connection to nature that's totally different than anything uh, you can imagine. Certainly very different than Disney World and the connection to, <laughs> to nature. Um, and then they've been to the bottling plants and they've been to the trade shows. Um, but I try not to push it on them because I, uh, I think at different levels, you know, one of our, our youngest son likes to wear his honest tea backpack to school. But the other ones, you know, they're a little older, maybe travel a little more incognito. Um, <laughs> that said, though, they are all interested in environment and sustainability. They're all vegetarians. They were vegetarians before my wife and I uh, were. Um, so they are, um, I'd say, leading in their own way. And, and um, I, I think I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if some of them pursue similar paths. Excellent. Others? Other questions? Alan. JB, you're next. Um, Seth, there, you know, it seems like there's more, uh, as you probably run into, more and more folks um, like yourself who want to do good and make money at the same time. Um, and for the most part, we, we force people into old boxes. Either you're a mm. for-profit or you're a non-profit. Yeah. Um, but there's new, <clears throat> there is more, there's getting to be more experimentation with uh, sort of a, a, a new sector, a hybrid sector. Yeah. Um, and about, I think, a dozen states now have passed these different laws B Corp. Uh, for, for, for benefit corporation yeah. or B Corp or yeah. L, L3Cs. Huh. What I was kind of interested yeah. in your take on this, whether we need a new, whether we need a new legal category that, that enshrines yeah. this double uh, bottom I mean, line. I don't have a problem with any of those. I think certainly the right spirit is all there. Um, but I don't know that we need it in order to, to happen. I mean, we certainly were, we were C Corp, uh, and it, didn't, it certainly didn't hold us back, and it certainly didn't make it any easier that, that a B Corp would. So I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm you know, friendly with the folks creating the B Corp. They're crown fellows. Henry and, crown yeah, fellows. Yeah, it's supportive. I, I like the idea, but it certainly wasn't necessary for us. To, what is necessary is to find entrepreneurs to, to take these risks. This is, corporations are not going to make these changes by themselves. Um, and, and I, the only caution I would have is sometimes a B Corp can create a permission structure to not build a robust, profitable business. And that can't be an excuse. We always, I was always haunted by the fact that if this business just sort of succeeds, um, then we're going to fulfill the skeptics who say, satisfy the skeptics who say you can't combine both. And I'm very proud of the fact that our founding investors made 26 times their original investment. <laughs> you know, so that was a good multiple. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, for us, it was like, we've got to demonstrate that this is, this is, this is good business. And the fact that, um, you know, if, if, if it weren't a high-performing business, then Coke wouldn't have been interested. Mm -hmm. You know, it has to be attractive, and it has to be proven in the marketplace. So that's the only downside that um, they might see of that. All righty. JP? Seth, what are some of the challenges and opportunities you see in changing the thinking of the youth market mm. through your product, yeah. and in particular the urban youth market? Hmm. Well, here's the, you know, our challenge is that our product is, is just on its first blush, is not going to taste as good as other products. We, you know, we do, people say we should be doing market research. They say, what, why, on our Honest Kids product, why do you want to do market research? I know it's going to lose. But the fact is, when you have a kid's lunchbox, and if there's an Honest Kids pouch in it, guess what he's going to drink? It's the only thing there. <laughs> They'll drink it. And on Monday, there may be, oh, this isn't exactly what I'm used to. On Tuesday, well, I guess I'll drink it. By the end of the week, you've changed that child's nutritional, exp I mean, taste expectations. It's harder to do that when you can't control the results. And if there's always sweet drinks out there that are priced at a much lower price point, it's hard. So it takes education and it takes awareness. And those are, we can do so much on our side, but we can't do all of the, that work. Um, so I certainly believe in, to the extent we can get, create broader awareness about nutritional education. 
I, I'm not a believer in, in uh, mandates. I don't think we can ban sweet drinks, but I, I certainly. Ask you, yeah, what yeah, you thought of that? Yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, Mayor Bloomberg's proposal, I actually came out against, which was weird for me to feel like I was, you know, taking that stance. But you know, this product, 70 calories per bottle, would have been banned in New York City. A Snapple with 240 calories would have been allowed. And no one's going to be able to tell me that a 240 calorie Snapple is better for you than this product. Um, or they wouldn't convince. They could tell me that, but they wouldn't convince me. So his his cutoff was 16 ounces. This is 16.9 ounces, and this is and his. Uh, so it was one of those just not rational. And I I have great respect for Mayor Bloomberg, and he's been to our office, and I appreciate his entrepreneurial. But that's the challenge with that kind of position. So it, it's a it's a very complicated question, but. You know, certainly as a, as a broader population, we have a huge, we're, we're, um, we're in a bad place. And I'll, I'll, I'll try not to get too preachy here, but um, the United Nations recently ranked the life, average life expectancy of all 200 countries. And even though we're the wealthiest nation in the history of the world and we have more advanced knowledge of science and medicine, we weren't number one or number two, we were number 40. So we've got real problems and, and we need to find solutions of how to do it. And it's, it's not just diet, it's lifestyle and it's our relationship to nature and to each other and how we, how we live and interact. It's, it's very uh, complicated. Others? Other questions? Yes. Back here and then we'll take you, sir. Hi, Seth. It's Frankie. <laughs> Hi. So I'm glad you said that because one of the things that I so believe in in changing this world is how we relate to each other in a workplace. Yeah. So I'm curious about practices that you have mm -hmm. for sharing power in a workplace. Yeah, yeah. Well, so um, we have certainly one of the important things for the first 10 years, the period of time in the book, uh, all, its, all employees had stock ownership. And that's changed, obviously, since Coca-Cola came on. But what we still do is that every employee um, really on down to very junior employees owns and controls their business. So each of them really does feel like an entrepreneur. That means they control all the P&L decisions, of what they spend, how they spend it, and they get to see it all. And it directly impacts their results and their bonus. So that to me, that's kind of the ultimate empowerment. It's not just to tell, you know, tell people they're empowered, but not give them the tools and information. Uh, beyond that, we, most of our we have about 112 employees. Um, 70 of them work from home. So that means they set their own hours, they set their own schedules. <laughs> they would say they work from their cars, but I mean they're out, <laughs> you know, <laughs> wherever they are. Um, and so it's very flexible that way. And, and we're certainly of the mindset that we've got to be investing not just in the nine to five worker. We have to invest not just in the employee, we have to invest in their whole family. Um, so certainly we provide health benefits for all of our employees, but we go beyond that in terms of we provide, if someone's under some kind of family stress, we have um, services we can provide that help, whether it's finding daycare or, or, or care for an elderly relative. Um, it's just part of our responsibility. And, and you can say we're being generous. I just say we're being, it's self-interest. We need to have, we want the whole employee, not just the one who shows up nine to five. Great. We have a question up here? Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I'm Garrett Mitchell. Um, I, I'm, I'm intrigued by the comment you made earlier about um, thinking you were a, a tea company and then you thought differently. And I wondered if you could uh, expand on that thinking a little bit. And it, it reminds me of, that, of the old story, which I'm sure you've encountered, about all those companies along the banks of the Delaware in the 19th century that were in the gunpowder business. Mm -hmm. And they all got out of it, yeah. except for one, DuPont, <laughs> which said, we're not in the gunpowder business, we're in the business of rearranging molecules. Yeah. So, if you, if, if you said at some point, um, uh, we're not just a tea company, what, what are you? Yeah. And, and linked to that, uh, it, did that cause you to change your value proposition, or does that, does that always stay the yeah. same? Well, and, and just to even another example closer to me is that for, um, Coke was started in, I guess, about 1875 or so. For, until mm. 1955, they only sold one product, which was Coca-Cola. And they realized they needed to be more than that. They needed to be a total beverage company. And, and certainly, um, we're, that's part of what their investment in us was. I think for us, we are a company that helps connect people to the natural world in a more direct and honest way. Um, that's the, without talking about beverages at all. And it does mean we need to be, and we do have the rights to honest food and honest snacks, and we need to think about how to make that more broad. My co-founder Barry says that one of the best names out there is Whole Foods, 
you know, you think about all the equities about Whole Foods, the, on, the only downside is you can only get it at Whole Foods stores. So what if you could get that similar experience everywhere you go, not just every store, but every restaurant, every mm -hmm. convenience store, uh, at home, in, in the workplace. Um, and so, yeah, I think we are, we certainly see a bigger opportunity and we are looking at some of those. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Stephen Balkum, how has the advent of social media changed the way you both communicate and engage yeah. with consumers, but also perhaps on your leadership style? Hmm. Well, I'm, a, I'm not very tech savvy. I just got a fancy phone. I didn't used to have one of those. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but it does mean we have to find, we've never been a company that's just gone for traditional media in terms of reaching people. So our initial marketing was sampling, you know, being hand to hand in the combat with that, uh, not combat, but in the connection, <laughs> sorry. Um, but, but now we've done, we found other creative ways to do it. And, and this summer we did our, for the fifth year, we've done our national honesty index. And what we've done is we set up nas um, racks of tea around the country with a sign that says a dollar bottle uh, honor system. And there's a Lucite box and we step back and we watch the results. And every year it's, uh, it's always sort of ratcheted up in terms of the level of attention we've gotten. So we were on the, um, we did it in 50 states this year. So we were on the Anchorage, you know, evening news and the, the Honolulu Evening News, people talking about our brand. Um, and it got very viral in terms of the, the website and the engagement. Um, it didn't, it, and it was a, it was certainly not a, uh, um, an academic would frown on it as an experiment. Nonetheless, it was an experiment that got a lot of attention and, and for us was a great way to, to reach people through less, not traditional means. And what'd you learn about honesty? Well, um, when, I taught, when I asked people, how honest do you think people are? They'd say, oh, what do you think, maybe 70%, 60%? 92% of people put money in the box, which was very encouraging to I me. I just didn't have any change in my no. life. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, so it's funny you say that because um, the most honest parts of the, the most honest states were um, Hawaii and Alabama, both had 100%. Maine and Indiana had 99%. We did it here in DuPont Circle. <laughs> And it was the lowest. It was 80%. And um, Shocking. ironically, I, I, I biked in. I biked uh, to the Bethesda Metro, took the Metro down. And when I got back to Bethesda, my bike had been stolen. <laughs> <laughs> so, welcome. So anyway, welcome people, to the nation. People are honest just by a good luck. <laughs> Other questions? Last question. Yes, right here. Uh, Mark Newberg, Five Stone Green Capital. First, I'm envious that you got Fisk's home run because <laughs> my first is the 86 series. Oh, yeah. That was patience. Uh, <laughs> I, that That's was, good for you. That, that was good for you. That's when I lost my chair. <laughs> um, how early did you realize how important supply chain sustainability was going to be to the core of the business? And what did you do yeah. to incorporate it? Yeah. In the beginning, it. in the beginning, we were just buying tea, literally from tea shops. I mean, we would buy it. You know, we go to a website, we'd find tea, and and so it wasn't something we could really invest in. And then we started to learn about um, how tea has grown and the fact that organic was so important. Um, uh, without getting too technical, tea is one of the few leaves uh, it, or agricultural products that's never rinsed. So when tea leaves are picked, if chemicals are sprayed on the leaves. Um, the only time those chemicals get sprayed off is when you pour hot water on the leaves to make the tea, and that's what you end up drinking. Um, so that, okay, right away, we said it's got to be organic. Um, and then we started to see the communities, uh, and, and really, uh, certainly in India, the tea growing communities are, are, these are relatively more affluent rural communities. These are um, holistic, you know, villages where there's health care and education in, in there. And, and so for us to be able to invest in these just seemed like a natural way to help. Uh, what's ironic, though, and this is, it's so not an irony I lose sleep over, but as we invest in these communities, and I've been to the schools where I ask the students, you know, what do you want to do? And I want to be an engineer in Bangalore, I want to be a, a doctor. And I say, how many of you want to work in the tea gardens? And not a hand goes up. So in the long term, there's a, there's a different challenge. I'm not, that's not something I'm worried about, but it is an interesting um, issue. But it, what's nice is that um, these gardens, certainly there's more, the supply chain has developed. You know, when we wanted to originally be organic, we there wasn't enough of a supply chain. And, and even through last week, we've heard about more communities converting to organic. Um, so that's a good thing. It's a good thing for the world. It's a good thing for, the, for those communities, too. Great. Seth, I want to take the prerogative and ask the very last question, which is, what's next for you? So you could have cashed out and yeah. said to Coca-Cola, I'm out of here. Yeah. You stuck around. Yeah. Uh, what's next? Well, the first thing that's important to say is I'm still really enjoying this work. I, I um, you know, uh, for the first 10 years, it was, there was a lot of pain points, as we share in the book. 
um, to get to the place where we could actually get national distribution. And, and so one of the reasons I'm not leaving is, you know, someone says, well, once you buy, you know, once the Coke buys it, doesn't mean I'm any less passionate about this. If anything, we've got incredible opportunities. But, um, tonight, I'm going, we're hosting in our office one of the five largest uh, national restaurant chains that's coming to talk about selling Honest Tea chain, you know, nationwide. I, I would have, you know, fantasized about, I would have spent a whole day fantasizing about that. <laughs> and now it's happening. So there's really important work to do. And the brand, I mean, we'll do over $100 million in sales this year, and that's good. And that'll be about, a that's $180 million in retail sales. But the charter, the, the, what in, what, when Coke invested, they said they want to build the next billion dollar brand. And so we still have some ways to go. I, and I, I, I don't know that'll be around for all of that, but I really want to see that uh, come to fruition. I want to make sure we're on that trajectory. Um, so I, I don't have any other plans. You know, I've always thought at some point um, politics would be interesting. And you know, for my time on Capitol Hill, I enjoyed that. Um, but as long as this can still be creative, challenging, impactful, and without compromise, um, I'm, I'm Tea Party's just getting started. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So, so with that, I want to say, uh, first of all, thank you for who you are. I mean, ever optimistic, um, ever smiling, ever positive about the future. Thank you so much for that. And thanks for a really honest book. I mean, it, this lives up to the brand. So I recommend it. And Seth, it's great to know you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you.